Okay, on this video, we're going to talk about um, something called the average rate of change of a function. So as an example, we'll start with this, finding the average rate of change of f of x equals x squared plus 3x on the interval. We're going to start with the interval from 1 to 4. So what are we talking about here? Um, you should know this is the graph of a parabola. Um, it's not one of the shifting things because of the uh, plus 3x. So it's not just like your base graph shifted. Um, for now, let's just be satisfied that it is a parabola. And it actually, I can tell because if you plug in zero, you're going to get zero. It does, if I was going to graph this, go through the origin. And let's just, we know it's an upward parabola. So we know it's going to curve upward like this. So here's our function. That's our parabola. And average rate of change on the interval, we're interested in the interval between one and four. So these are x values. Okay, these are x values. These are x. So the points on the parabola here would be one f of one, right? I want to find the y value. I could plug one into my function. And this point right here is four f of four. And what all average rate of change is, is if you connected these two points on this parabola with a straight line, we call this a secant line. And all average rate of change is, I'm going to abbreviate average rate of change arc. Average rate of change is nothing more than just the slope of the secant line between two points on a graph. Okay, and it's it's actually, this is sort of a, a preview of calculus. Um, one of the things we'll be interested in calculus is finding the slope when you think of slope, you usually think of lines, but we can talk about the slope of a curved graph like a parabola. Imagine this is a, a road that you're driving up, you're going uphill. Well, your slope is constantly changing as you move from left to right. So at any given point, we like to talk about in calculus, this is, a, this is something a little bit extra here. We talk about the slope of a tangent line. A tangent line is a slope right at a particular point that matches the slope of your graph. That's called a tangent line slope. Um, so we get to that in calculus, right? And it's all built to find the slope of the tangent line. It actually starts with finding the slope of the secant line. Okay, so given that it's just the slope of the secant line and we, we have two points, uh, the slope of our secant line, I'm going to put m, most people associate that with slope, of my secant line, in this case would be change in y, so f of 4 minus f of 1 over the change in x, which is going to be 4 minus 1. Um, so this could be f of 4, now we have to find out what that is. If you plug in 4 into your function, that is 16 plus 12. Looks like it's 28. F of 1, if you plug that in, 1 squared plus 3 times 1 is 4. And this will get divided by 3. 28 minus 4 is 24 divided by 3. So I get an answer of 8, which seems reasonable. That is definitely a positive slope. In general, so a formula for your average rate of change, if I give you two numbers here, we could also denote that between the numbers A and B. So if A is my left-hand endpoint, uh, B is my right-hand X value, then your average rate of change formula, if it's basically this, is just F of B minus F of A over B minus A. And again, that stands for the slope of the secant line. Now, Working with that formula, there's a couple of other formulas that we get asked to simplify in pre-calculus that are related, directly related to the slope of the secant line. Suppose I ask for the uh, average rate of change on the interval from A to X. In other words, I'm just gonna just randomly call this left-hand X value A 
and this is x. So this is like a equals a, and, and I'm treating b like x. We know average rate of change is, I've got the formula right there, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. But if I did the same formula for these values of a and b, what would I get? I would get f of b, which is the same as just f of x, minus f of a over x minus a. And I'm going to bubble this because this is a formula that you will get asked to simplify um, often. And I just want you to know you're really just finding the average rate of change just kind of general between uh, a and some random um, x value. So for us, now remember our function is, we're using the same parabola, it's x squared plus 3x. So simplifying this, f of x, well, it's sitting right there. It's x squared plus 3x. f of a, to do f of a, it's just like you would do any number. If I asked you to do f of 2, what you would do is plug 2 in for both of your x's. So f of a means you're going to plug a in for both of your x's. So I get a squared plus 3a. Now, I am subtracting this, which has a sum. So it is important that I use parentheses there. And then I'm dividing by x minus a. It's a little, most books are a little bit vague on what they mean by simplifying this. Because somebody might look at that and say, well, that looks simplified enough to me. To simplify this formula, you simplify it when you get this x minus a to cancel. So I'm going to put in quotes, simplify means cancel out the x minus a term, this one right here in the denominator. And there's always a way to do that. There's always a way to cancel that out using just algebra. If I distribute this negative, I'm going to get x squared plus 3x minus a squared minus 3a. And to cancel this out, we're going to do an old factoring technique where we're going to group. So we're going to group the x squared minus the a squared, and then group the 3x minus the 3a. I'll kind of emphasize that I'm grouping those with parentheses. This, of course, factors into x plus a, x minus a. And from the second term, I can factor out a 3. And then notice in the numerator, both terms have an x minus a. So if I factor that out, and I'm just going to put brackets just to emphasize that I'm pulling that out. If I pull out x minus a from this term, I'm left with x plus a. If I pull out x minus a from this term, I'm left with 3. And now we see that the x minus a, since it's multiplication, will cancel out with that, leaving me with x plus a plus 3. Okay, now this is kind of maybe an unsatisfying result. Remember that what we're talking about, the average rate of change does represent the slope. And uh, what's going on here is because we don't have specific numbers, we're going to get a formula for slope that has x and a in it. So it's, it's, a, it's a general formula. Like if I gave you an x value and I gave you an a value, you could, of course, plug that in and get, get a, um, an actual numerical answer. There's another formula maybe even more common than the one we just did that describes average rate of change in a more general way without numbers. And that is computing the average rate of change on the interval from x to x plus h. So this would be like my a, this would be like my b. And again, we're just doing, it's the same thing. This is x, this is x plus h and we're finding the slope of the secant line, SEC for secant. Now, one thing you can actually see, what is h? What does that represent? Well, if this is x and this x coordinate is x plus h, h must be the distance between these two points, which is literally what it represents, okay? And uh, this particular formula that we're gonna talk about, if we get, fill this in for our average rate of change, 
Again, it's still f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So it's going to be f of x plus h minus f of x divided by x plus h minus x. And so because of that, you can see that the x's actually cancel out in the denominator and we end up with f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. So this again is the formula for the average rate of change, but uh, this particular formula we really, really use frequently in calculus um, to compute something called the derivative, which gives us the slope of the tangent line, as I was mentioning before. So we use this formula really, really often. And so we do give it a special name. This is referred to as the difference quotient. Okay, but again, it's just the average rate of change. So let's see how that works. Let me rewrite my function. My function is x squared plus 3x. And I want to simplify f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. And again, just like the last one, what do we mean by simplify this? Like the last one we saw, we had to cancel out the x minus a. This time to simplify it, what has to happen is this h in the denominator has to cancel. Simplify. So h cancels. That h in the denominator. That's how you know how, when it's simplified. Okay. F of x plus h, this is looks a little weird, but just like I did with f of a or f of anything, if somebody asks you to do f of something, you're going to replace this in for your x's. You're going to plug that in. So that's going to give you x plus h squared plus 3 times x plus h minus f of x, which is sitting right there. Again, because there's a minus and it's two things being subtracted, make sure you use parentheses, divided by h. We're going to cancel that h out. This time, we're going to the algebra we're going to do. We're just going to multiply this out. Remember that x plus h squared is not just x squared plus h squared, right? You have to actually multiply out x plus h times x plus h. So you're going to get an x squared plus h x plus another h x plus h squared. So that's going to give you x squared plus two h x plus h squared, plus 3x plus 3h, distributing this minus, minus x squared minus 3x. And we see that x squareds cancel out, 3x minus 3x. And notice everybody who's left over has at least one power of h in it. So we're going to factor out the h. 2x plus h and then plus 3. We'll cancel out the h in the denominator. And again, to be clear, it's the h in the denominator that needs to cancel. My answer still has an h in it. That's OK, but as long as that h in the denominator cancels out. So this would be my answer. So we're going to focus more on those two formulas. Now, simplifying the two formulas, general formulas for average rate of change for different functions here. How about f of x equals 7x plus 2? Here's the second formula, f of x minus f of a over x minus a. f of x is 7x plus 2. f of a is 7a plus 2. If we distribute the negative, we get 7x minus plus 2 minus 7a minus 2. So our 2s cancel. And if we factor out a, a, a 7, this one's really easy to simplify. We end up with just an answer of 7. Now, I just wanted to point this out. Why on the last one, we didn't have just a number when we used this formula, but why would that make sense? Again, remember 
I always want you to remember what does these, this formula, and we're about to do the difference quotient, both of those formulas represent the average rate of change, which is the slope of the secant line, which if you recall, is like taking any two points on the graph and finding the slope. The first one I showed you was a parabola. And so the slope uh, depends on where you are, right? Which points you take, but we know this is a linear function. This is just a straight line, y equals seven x plus two. And if we took any two points and found a secant line between them, it's gonna be the same as the slope as the line, of the line, right? Namely, it's going to come out to be seven, no matter which two points we take. So it totally makes sense why the answer is just seven. Whereas again, if you go back to, if you go back to a parabola, when we simplified the difference quotient on our parabola, we had a, like a function here. And that's because it depends on which two points you take to do your secant line, right? You're not always gonna get the same slope, but for a line, you will. If you tried the f of x plus h, the difference quotient formula, you should be able to show that you also get seven using that formula as well. Let's move to a more interesting function. f of x equals three over x plus two. Um, you may or may not know what the graph of this is at this point. Um, this is a rational function. It does have a vertical and a horizontal asymptote involved, but uh, right now we just want to simplify this formula. f of x minus f of a is going to give me 3 over x plus 2 minus 3 over a plus 2, all divided by x minus a. And remember, my goal is to cancel out this x minus a term. The only way I can see we're going to be able to do that is we're going to have to combine these two um, fractions with a common denominator. So this one's gonna get multiplied top and bottom by a plus two. This one top and bottom by x plus two. So we're gonna get, now we have the same denominator in, in, up here in the numerator, which is x plus two, a plus two. And what do I have? I have three a plus six. This minus is going to get distributed to both of those, minus three x minus six. Now here's another thing, that's all up here. I'm, and then I wanna divide this by x minus a, which I could always think of x minus a as x minus a over one, meaning I'm gonna multiply by the reciprocal one over x minus a. And sure enough, if you cancel out the sixes, and since I wanna have X first, I'm gonna factor out a negative three from the top. If I take out a negative three from this term, that's X, take out a negative three from positive three A, I'm gonna be left with minus A. And we can see now that the X minus A the original x minus a term in the denominator cancels out. And once that happens, I am done. So my answer is negative three divided by x plus two times a plus two. Let's see the difference in simplifying this particular one now with the other formula for average rate of change, the difference quotient. f of x plus h minus f of x over h f of x plus h, I'm replacing x with x plus h, minus f of x, which is three over x plus two. The whole thing is divided by h. It's actually very much the same here. The only way I'm gonna cancel that h out is if I do a common denominator. So this one, as close as they look, but you have to assume these denominators are totally different. So I have to multiply this one top and bottom by x plus two, not x plus h. And this one top and bottom by x plus h plus two. So I'm going to get 
Okay, denominators are the same, so I only need to write it once. It's x plus h plus 2 times x plus 2. Same idea, I want to distribute 3x plus 6. This minus 3, minus 3x, minus 3h, minus 6. And same idea as the, as the previous problem, too. I want to think of h as h over 1. And then instead of dividing by h, I want to multiply by 1 over h. I guess one reason, one thing to think about here is if my goal is to cancel out this h, and now it's in the denominator here, there is no reason to FOIL this out. You can if you want to, but that's not going to help cancel out the h. The only thing that's going to cancel out the h is from something up here. So, so you don't need to really simplify any more here. You don't have to multiply that out. Sure enough, 3x is cancel. 6 is cancel. And once those happens, once those cancel, then negative 3h over h, the h's will cancel. And I'm going to be left with negative 3 over x plus h plus 2 times x plus 2. <coughs> okay. One more just to show you how this works for different types of functions. If I had a radical function, a square root function, f of x equals the square root of 2x plus 5. So f of x minus f of a over x minus a will be the square root of 2x plus 5 minus the square root of 2a plus 5 divided by x minus a. My goal is to cancel out that x minus a. Well, what am I going to do here? I can't square, right? This isn't an equation. This is an expression. This is my formula that I'm using to get this expression. It's not equal to anything. So I can't square because I don't have an equation to do the same thing on the other side. And what we're going to do here is use an old algebra skill that you've used many, many times before, but maybe aren't thinking of it in this situation. In previous math class, in, in algebra, if you had, for example, 1 over the square root of 7 minus 2, you were told that there was something not right with this answer, right? You were told to simplify it. And what's the rule? They did not like any radicals in the denominator, okay? The truth is when you get to calculus, nobody cares if you leave a square root in the denominator, but that's, that's, you have to earn that right by making it to calculus. So how did we get rid of that? You may remember we multiplied top and bottom by what we call the conjugate, which is root seven plus two. And by doing that, the numerator is just gonna be one times root seven plus two. So that's root seven plus two. And if you FOIL this out, root 7 times root 7 is 7. The middle terms will cancel, right? That's 2 root 7 minus 2 root 7. And then I end up with minus 4. So I end up with root 7 plus 2 over 3. This was just a side note. This is just to remind you about the conjugate. So then the idea is, it's not because we have a square root in the denominator that we're going to do this but it's because we need to simplify. We need to somehow get rid of this x minus a, and we don't have any other options. So what we're going to do is multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the numerator, which is the square root of 2x plus 5 plus the square root of 2a plus 5. And so when I do this, the square root times itself just cancels out. The middle terms will cancel out just the same way they happened here with numbers. So I don't get to write them. And then I end up with negative square root of two a plus five times positive square root of two a plus five, which is negative two a plus five. I'm gonna have a giant denominator here. We're gonna have x minus a times square root of 2x plus 5 plus the square root of 2a plus 5. If I distribute the negatives, the negative, 2x plus 5 minus 2a minus 5,
the fives will cancel. With what's left over, you can factor out a two. And that'll give me that x minus a that I wanted to have to cancel out the x minus a in the denominator. And once that happens, we've canceled that out. Um, most of the time in pre-calc, even though, like I said, it's more of a calculus thing, but this is kind of, like I said, based on a, something we're gonna do in calculus quite frequently, it's okay to leave this like this. If it bothers you, you can multiply by the conjugate again to get rid of the square root and the denominators, but most of the time you will not have to. In my class, you won't have to. You can leave, leave it like this. Okay. Now, it's very much the same process uh, where you're going to need the conjugate if you do this work with the same function and do the difference quotient. Um, but it's probably good practice. So if you this is a good be a good time to pause the video. Practice, let me rewrite the function. Practice simplifying this expression for the same function. Okay, assuming you've tried that, let's just see how this works. Now you have to plug in x plus h in for your x. So you're going to end up with the square root of 2x plus h plus 5 minus f of x, all divided by h. Again, the issue is I have to cancel that h, and there's nothing really, no other choice here but to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. Okay, and then when we do that, square root times itself cancels. So we end up with 2x plus h plus 5. Middle terms, if you're doing the conjugate correctly, will always cancel out. So we're just going to have minus square root times itself. That's minus 2x plus 5 over h times, we'll just slide this over. Let's distribute the minus and distribute the two here as well. 2x plus 2h plus 5 minus 2x minus 5. And the two x's will cancel, the fives will cancel. Once those cancel, then I can cancel the H's out here. So I'm gonna be left with just two over. It does a very similar looking answer, isn't it? It's just two over the square root of two times X plus H plus five plus the square root of two X plus five. All right, hopefully um, you know now what the average rate of change is and feel better about simplifying those two formulas, the difference quotient and the other one, um, because this is a big thing we'll do in calculus very frequently. All right.